beautiful people welcome once again today on the noble show the show is proudly brought to you by c ryan travels and c ryan car rentals if you need anything in regards to uh, your traveling your your ticketing your visa or anything just call c ryan travels on 0264623091 today we're talking to an amazing personality whose work has impacted a lot of people all over Africa. Let's find out who he is. We'll be right back. This week on the Noble Show, our guest is Apostle Pascal Amanfo. He is a preacher, a movie director, a writer, and an actor. He has a lot of passion for the things of God, especially to drive the hearts of people to God. He is also the founder of the PLC Church. Apostle Pascal Amalfo on The Noble Show. Welcome back from the break. This is still The Noble Show. Today on the show, we're talking to my personal person. Uh, he's a movie director, he's a writer, and above all, he's an amazing and a highly anointed man of God. He has passion for the things of God and he loves God so much. Today, we're talking to Pascal Amalfo. Welcome. My darling. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Precious, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been a while. You've been dodging me. I caught you here today. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, um, I've been having a little wilderness experience, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm okay now. Okay. Yeah. Um, everyone knows you, so I don't want to go into tell us a little bit about yourself sort of thing. Okay. What is it about Pascal that we don't know about? Uh, well... Um, well, I mean, when, once you have a little bit of a public life, I think people know the much that they can know. I think what people don't know perhaps will be, you know, um, the man with struggles, the man with, you know, sometimes his doubts, his, his failures, his, his um, you know, disappointments and, you know, his, his moments of, you know, weakness where even as he, as he encourages people and blesses people, he sometimes asks questions, has questions that, you know, he's also looking for answers. So I think that part people never get to see because once you are this, um, you have this public life, people have a perception that, you know, the person they see on screen, the public image, they don't know the man behind the man. So I think people never see that side. Okay, I, so who is the man behind <laughs> Pascal? Uh, the man behind the man. Well, the man behind Pascal Manfu is... Um, as a little boy with dreams and who believed in a future that uh, didn't have any reason to believe in that kind of future and who fought his way to the top. The man who, you know, watched his parents go through a divorce, who was raised by a single mom, the man who, you know, never really had a father in his life, who had to teach himself to be a man, the man who never sat in a filmmaking class all his life but became by God's grace, uh, a modest, celebrated film director, and the man who learned, you know, to do life by himself, and by God's grace, you know, God's mercy and grace found him. So people don't know that man, the story behind the glory, and so that man has his own um, inadequacies, his own <laughs> non-accomplishments, but he wakes up every day and believes that, you know, there's still a reason to keep pushing and to make impact. A man for is a Ghanaian name. It's a Ghanaian name, right? Okay, this is another story. I have to tell you story. No, it's not, it's not Ghanaian. It's not Ghanaian. No, it's it not sounds Ghanian. like it a sound, Ghanaian. Yes. Um, when I'm my good days, I'll say it's a name from Zion. <laughs> 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 it's very Ghanaian and also very Nigerian. It's, it's, it's Ghanaian from, you know, Mankasim, Emilia, Amina, and, you know, some accounts also are man for. It's also Nigerian from a particular tribe and you don't get too many it's not like the obese or the uchis or the makers you, you have a man for just one place in the entirety of nigeria so there are stories about migration we don't know who, what who came from what and so where. you're half nigerian i suppose i'm african <laughs> i want to know <laughs> are you fully nigerian i'm nigerian or i'm nigerian 100 percent. 100 percent. so what are you doing here who brought you here? I, you I'm here because I have to be on the Noble Show. And it's an amazing no, 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 no. <laughs> what are you doing in my country? <laughs> no, I, I think work brought me here a couple of years ago. And um, now I can say by divine orchestration, but then I would say by work. And it just became convenient to be here because I was working more here than in Nigeria. I'd done a script which I'd found his way into Ghana. And uh, Abdusalam Mumuni saw the script and like, who wrote this? I want this guy here. And I came by 
So I would do like three, four months here and do one month back in Lagos. At some point in a year, it's because I was eight months in Ghana and then four months in Nigeria. It made no sense to be there any longer. So I just felt, you know what? And then why not you know, see what I can do here? And then here had the more, it was a more relaxing environmental film, you know. Nigeria is a larger market, such a rush. You know? And here you could control your content better as a director, as a writer. So I kind of found um, uh, my roots here, <laughs> kind of. And then the rest, I think, is history. OK. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk um, a little bit about your career. OK. Um, did you um, aspire to be an, um, an actor or a movie director or, or something that just came along the line and you grabbed it? I always wanted to be an actor. Uh, I wanted to be an actor. I think I really wanted to act. Um, I never th thought I would end up a film director or a writer. It was acting, basically. And so I always tell people, if I look like this now in size and body frame, imagine what I look like in, say, late 1999 or 2000. You know, every young guy wanted to act then. And so it took me a while to discover that you know, there were other you know, avenues to express myself beyond the acting. So I wanted to act, but acting wasn't wasn't happening. Oh, okay. Then I discovered I, I had a, you know, a knack for wanting to tell stories in a particular way. You know? So I started writing. You know, I, was just, I was like a madman, just you know, write. Then it was but basically... What inspires your writing? Because most of your stories are very nice. So. I, 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 I go to bed, bite my nose in the morning, and these things pop up in my head. I, I don't you know when people talk about you know, getting high or going to the sitting by the beach, or I don't know what they're talking about. It's just... It's just <laughs> So would you say it's a gift or...? Now I can say the God factor. Back then I was just this crazy creative person. Now I can say the God factor because there's no way to explain it. Now I can say the God factor. As soon as I shut my eyes, it just... Boom, boom. And every single film or story I have done is something that came out of an imagination. Virtually I could see the pictures. And so when I go on set, I know exactly that, no, this is not what I had in my head. It has to be this way. So now I can say it's the God factor, the influence of God's spirit. But back then, I just thought it was just, I was just this gifted, madly gifted person. Okay. Yeah. Um, you as a, a CRIF now, mm -hmm. and now you've um, graduated to being uh, your own boss. Mm -hmm. You have your own church now and things are going on well. What happened? How did you accept Christ? What changed? Okay, the, the thing people don't really know is um, people know me from the movie industry days. They don't know me, you know, pre those days. Um, my parents went their separate ways very, you know, early in life. And so I, I found reasons to be with my mother. And so I was in a boarding school. And so for some of the holidays and meeting breaks, my mom would leave with my grandfather because she was just trying to find her feet in life. My grandfather went to Roman church, but there's a group in the Roman Catholic church called the Charismatics. He was so into the Charismatics. And you know, he had this you know, house that had a bit of space. So most of the meetings were held in the house. So as a young boy, I'd be at home and hear these people coming on Monday and Tuesday on Wednesday and they're praying, they're talking in tongues. People are I'm like, what are these crazy people doing? And so it went on every meeting break, was, uh, it, was, it was held for me because it was in this space where all these old folks and all they were doing was just praying. So one day, very inquisitive, out of extreme boredom, I went to my grandfather's library. I was looking through some books, and I saw this particular tape. It was Benny Hinn's Miracle Crusade in Tulsa. And I, put, I, don't, I was just being inquisitive, putting the tape in this old features book. And I saw this man with a very funny Jewish, now I know he's Jewish, but very funny accent, you know, yeah. waving his jacket. And I was like, what is this guy doing? I didn't know exactly what it was, but I, something just popped up in my spirit. I went back to the library and I saw this book, The Anointing. You know, I started reading the book and I was just thrown into this new world of wanting to know God in a different way, right? And a young boy who uh, went At what to, age was that? This was uh, nine, ten-ish, okay. kind of, you know. So I was only know. So the next time they were doing fellowship meetings, now I was interested. You know, I wanted to sing along something. And from there, my journey began. Now, the Charismatics would do this program yearly called the Life in the Spirit Seminar, where they would take you through being born again, and it ends up with you being baptized. It's always somewhere after Easter, it ends with Pentecost, you know. So I went through that, and the Pentecost hands got laid on me, and then, boom. We were a couple of young boys that were just on fire. It was crazy fire. We, we thought we could walk on water. We thought, like, it was like, show me the devil, and we'll beat him to death. So that explains the whole story about me ending up, you know. Where, so on Sundays, we'll go to the Roman Mass, 
after that prayer meetings were 12. So in between the mass and the 12, you, go, you had to go and do compulsory evangelism. So one of these is we're walking by and we came to the place and we're shrine. And we're about to pass it. How dare we pass a shrine? Who says, you know, and we're walking to the shrine when we preach the gospel? And I was like 10 years old, basically. So that started from there. But I think when you get to know God very early as a young person, you get very familiar with church. It gets to a point in my late teens, I started to feel like I had known scriptures in my spirit. I had, I was so familiar with the whole church experience that it started to become such a bore. And then I got exposed to this new film world and it was like, wow, this is life. So I veered off that track. Uh, that this is me having pastoring SU in secondary school, you know, and going to found, find uh, found the fellowship on. on so would you, you know? say that I'm not cutting yeah. you, but would you say that um, getting into movie and all of that made you backslide? Yes, but that's my that's my story. So what is the kind of life in that circle? It's it's you know you pre that life, even if you were you know conceiving sin, you had to think about it and plan it right. This was in a world where sin is sin come to me, <laughs> I'm right here. And everyone around you doesn't bat an eyelid when you're it's, it's the life, you are expected to be that way. I mean, actors do whatever, great people do that way, you know. So, and for the first few years I was like, okay. And then you get sucked in because you realize that everyone around you is living that life, you know. So I veered off. And of course I knew God, so uh, salvation was very much my thing. So this new experience was what was on me and all of that. So yes, I had the years where I would have cycles of, you know, in a year, eight months, oh, I can't do leave this. And then the next four months, I would go off again. I had this running battle with God where I was constantly being prodigal, going, coming back. And, but I think the foundation I had, something was constantly pulling me back. You know, the hands of grace and mercy kept me that no matter how, quote unquote, bad I was, I didn't lose sight of the fact that there was a life where I found fulfillment or gift and which was with God. So somewhere behind my spirit, I had that. So how did you come back home to God? So, um, of course, film took a great part of... I've done film for like 20 years, so from late 99 or early 2000. So I'm just getting to the first year. And that's for some acting, writing, I, the desire to make a name for myself was so huge in me, and that blinded me. But I guess you get to the point where you, people think you are the ish, or you, and you, you feel worthless. You feel that there's something more. So I got to that place, and there was something missing from my life. You know, I, premieres, you had expressed yourself in different films, and you know, had something little going for you, but there was something more. And I knew that it was... God, because I, I was living life on my own time. And I share this everywhere, and I think that's, it's not new anymore, it's an old story. Much of my whole film experience was, was given to fleshy lust and sexual immorality. I was, I was a writer, so I was very creative. I mean, mm -hmm. I had fantasies in my head. I, was, I, mean, I, was, I just called myself a creative beast. I had an alter ego, which I, you know, I, I, I expressed myself to the depth of my imaginations, and that was also very sexually. And I, I thought that at one point drove my creativity and all of that. And so now I understand the struggle that people in the industry go through. People don't know that life because I've lived that life. So at, at that point, having done that and done everything I could do, at some point in my life, I said, you know what? I want to be in the strip in Las Vegas. I just want to be in Las Vegas oh. and feel what it feels like to be in the strip. I want to see Caesar's place and feel that. And I went to Las Vegas. And you went to do I that? went strip. I just I want to see the casino experience, the whole, you know, naked women. Self. I just wanted to sit there and feel. And I did that. So you do it and you come back and you feel like, okay, so is this it? So I realized there was something more so emptiness in me. So one day in Spintex, I used to have this little apartment. I just sat down one day and it felt like my entire life flashed before my eyes. There was such nothingness to it all. Nothingness. I, I was miserable, empty. And I said, I said, God, I'm tired, you know. I don't want to live life another day on my own terms. I'm, I'm sick of it, you know, faking happiness and all of that. And so I just said, you know what, from today, I gave up. And I cried. And I, you know, the more I cried, I felt like a light in the room. The more I cried, the more the light intensified. I just kept crying. I cried till past midnight. I prayed as much as I can. I woke up the next morning. I put up the first post on Instagram. And people went, OK, you know, you know how that is. And from there, I guess it was me coming back to who I really was. Like I say, you come to yourself. And from there, 
it's been just God's grace and God's mercy. You know, I heard things like give him six months, he'll come back. Give him like one yeah. year in front of He's going through a phase, he's going to midlife crisis. So people were all judgmental. Oh, and all of that. course, of course. I got and how did you take that? I knew that this was the life for me. And I, I had people tell me like, you know what? Your validation is hidden in your consistency, so keep at it. So okay. I initially, for the first one year, it was very difficult because the industry shut down on me. You know, because um, what happens is that the church can't fully accept you because they don't know, is he really for real? And then your past world also feel like, okay, they don't know how to address you. Do, I, do we call him brother because you're now yeah. too creep? So you are lost in this, in this place where... So I went through that for the first one, which was pretty, very difficult, you know. But I had, you know, of course, I... People like Timothy, Bentoum, you know, at some point, which was you know, the first one I could call in this life, you know, brother and all that. And so I had a conference where he came and, you know, drove all the way to Shy Hills, my first conference program, young people, and preached and ministered. So you got encouraged by people which hold your hand and say, you can do this. Okay. So early enough, though I was in the fire, I just knew that at some point God would come true because for me, I knew that this was where I found. And some peace, you know, that kind of peace when you know that. You know, you go broke, you go to a wilderness, yeah, but it's okay, yeah. just okay, you just want to be in him, yeah. you know. So I had that peace, and it took me through one year, and then second year, and then, you know, God just put the pieces together. Pascal, we're still talking to Pascal Lamar when he's sharing a lot today with us on The Noble Show. Don't go anywhere, stay and stay. Are you planning a trip, or you're going for a holiday with a lot of destinations all over the world? Just decide on where you want to go and see Ryan Travels will take you there. We offer you a visa, air ticketing, tour packages, hotel reservations, corporate travels, and many more. You can contact C Ryan Travels on 0264. 623-091 or 0302-408067. You can email C. Ryan Travels at c.ryantravels at gmail.com. C. Ryan Travels, you pack, we plan. Welcome back from the break. This is the Noble Show and we are talking to the amazing Pascal Amal for P. Yeah, I have to yeah. stop calling you P on <laughs> Um, when you were not in Christ, yeah. your line of stories were different. Yeah. And now that you are in Christ, are you going to write the same kind of stories or there's a difference between the stories you write now and the stories you used to write before? There's a huge difference. Now you, know, you have the influence of God's Spirit and, of course, your faith, which you need to try and you know, you know, project and minister to people. Now you see a film as a tool basically for propagating the gospel. It's no longer just a bit of expression. So yes, so now I find a way. It's not as if I have Jesus mentioned in every scene, but subtly at the end of the day, it comes back to staring people to see God, even though the story might not be all out Christian. So yes, there's that influence. So you're not going to um, direct, even though, even if you didn't write the story, somebody wrote saying you're supposed to direct it, you're not going to direct it if it's not a Christian or one. No, no, I turn down scripts all the time. Sometimes I rewrite for people, but many of them. For example, when I did Sin City with Yvonne Nelson, there was a scene that Michelle McKinney Hammond played in there where she just sat down as a mother and spoke a scripture. That scene was deliberately written so that I have that influence in the, in the story. So when I can't have my control over the project, no, I won't touch it. Wow. Well, yep. Thank you. I really <laughs> serious with business now. Yes. Yes, basically. Okay. Um, do you have any regrets? Or is, this, is there one thing that you regret doing that you wouldn't want to repeat again? I guess it was not finding myself early. I feel like I wasted a lot of time finding my. I feel like I feel like time went by, and I feel like your life comes in phases. And now what I'm doing now, I should have done probably, you know, ten years ago or something. So I feel like now I'm trying to, you know, I'm constantly ask, asking God for mercy that you know the time is redeemed. So I think I I, I finally came to this place of of purpose late and so because you, you can you can live almost a lifetime you know just living not and just existing not living because purpose is what brings you the essence of your life so i think i'm late and, and so now um 
But thankfully, the message of God just, you know, gives a second chance. So I think yeah. I'm really late in some of the things I'm doing now, which I should have done, you know, at the time when I really had that influence at my beck and call. I think that's a warm thing. But then again, you think about it and you think, okay, maybe it's God's timing. Maybe yeah. I had to go through what I had to go through to get to this point. But sometimes I felt like I wish when I was, you know, late yeah. 20s or so. And you look at people who started ministry early and how far God has taken them and all of that. But our journeys are different. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, ever since you, you got back to Christ, mm -hmm. has there been any challenging moment in your life where you said, God, I'm done. I can't do this again. Or you almost gave up, gave up or you, you've already given up. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I always say, I tell them in church, I say, God and I have history. You know, it's like uh, those uh, um, romantic relationships where you tell them, I'm done, I'm done, I'm, I'm leaving you. <laughs> and then you go home and then you text, but have you eaten? You know? <laughs> so I tell them, I say, God and I, God and I we have that history. Like, I'm, I'm sick of it, I'm done. And then you go back and then you're lying in bed and, you know, you know, you hear worship and then suddenly you are crying and you're saying, Father, you know, so we, we, I go through that with him. And I, I learned how to express myself beyond that whole, uh, beyond the sovereignty of God. He's my father. So I can tell him I'm tired. God, you know I am tired. I, I can't do this no more. He knows that I'm, I'm not saying that out of, not wanting to do it, out of pain. I'm, why is it so difficult, you know? So yeah. I learned how to speak to him that way. Because 2019, about two years now, I went through something that was, you know, a very, you know, People that moment of my life. So I learned how to, because tongues was not doing it for me. You know, scriptures, I knew all the scriptures. I wanted to talk to God. Listen, this is difficult. Why does it have to be this way? So I went through, then I said, I'm done. And COVID came, and I, I, you know, I switched and said, well, this world, the world is coming to an end. Let me just wait. <laughs> <laughs> you know? okay. But then again, August, you, you know, suddenly, so you, that fire stays up, stays up in you, and you know what I know. There's no other place you, found, you find fulfillment but leaving for purpose. And then you pick up again, and you say, Father, you know, this is me. And thankfully, you know, Grace always qualifies the unqualified and he, yeah. he never, his arms are always are straight to say, come back home soon. So yes, I have moments like that. People in the industry, your industry, the moving industry, uh, uh, how did it take your new turn? Hmm. Were, were, they, were they, okay, were some of them uh, moving away from you? Were some of them saying things that they were not supposed to say? Or did some of them embrace you? How was it like? Nobody will embrace you. Oh man, for himself, but <laughs> but will embrace you. Stories will fly left, right, center. You know, going through a midlife crisis. Oh, maybe he has HIV. Maybe he's dying. Maybe people see all kinds of stuff. You know, it's an industry where talk drives entertainment. So what, what are some of the things you heard about yourself? Uh, people said that you know I was I was I was you know confused. You know, going through a crisis. You know, that kind of thing. I didn't know. You know, um, people said now when ministry came, I was an avenue to make money, you know, I'm yeah. trying to rebrand myself now, so, <laughs> you know, pastors now. So I had someone, you know, someone very respected, you know, and I, I said to another person, I said, tell him that, please, I could rent him a hall and buy instrument, give him six months. When he makes the money, let's, uh, uh, let's know that, so at least I know <laughs> business is good. So you go through all of that. So yes, you hear all kinds of stories. And some people, then I remember, people were right under your comments, you know, after you've been doing that, now you are coming to tell us about God and all of that. But the testimony is that the people who say, what's he doing now, now say, please pray for me. Because they've seen you over time. And they get to the place where they realize, no, this must be God. So I think your validation is hidden in consistency. And God will, as a matter of fact, let you go through that process. You'll be doubted, laughed at, ridiculed. In fact, I say that if you don't go through that, then it's probably not God. You know, and then when you come out, he'll put the pieces together and then he will now reveal you again. But did that make, make you give up or did that make, make you feel bad no, 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 at no, some no, point? No, no, or no. It didn't bother no, you no, at all? I, I, no, no, at that point, it, uh, no, no. At that point, I was too, I had cut something that, you know, I was too, too, too consumed by the, to even listen, you know. I was too, no, no, no. The more they spoke, the more I went at it. The more they spoke, the more I, you know, then came, my brother Timothy Bentum, then came Majid Michel. We were like, I mean, we, we don't, I mean, we, we, we preach the gospel and everywhere. It was, okay. it was, it was, it was really. I think it was a phase where I needed them to talk and I needed to trust God more or learn the fact that you know, my my ordination is not in their validation. It comes from God. So I needed that experience. So it didn't bother me one bit. Okay, talking about the gospel, give me five uh, scriptures that you love the most. The first one, anyone who has heard me preach very hard, the first one will be Jeremiah 1 verse 5. You know, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. I mean, 
And then the second one would be um, Psalm 2, you know, how they increase the trouble remain the bitter of my soul is not here for him, God, but thou God have a shield for me. You know, that that that's because I, I leave scriptures and faces and and then this scripture amazing one I, I like is Psalm 5 verse 2. I've said he has encompassed you with favor as a shield. That's amazing how favor becomes your defense. And then at some point I was so much into First Corinthians 2 9 that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, you know. So it means people don't even know what you're becoming. People don't, yeah. people can't, you know, it's not entered into the heart of man. The things that God has proposed, you know, that, that's, that's, that's powerful. Uh, and then the last one will be, now you said your favorite, so. Uh, yeah, so this, this one, um, John 1, 12, so many that received him, gave him the power to become, you know, sons of God. And I like the, the B part. It said, who are born, not of the flesh, not the will of man, but are born of God. So getting born again, or realizing that I'm not just, having a religious experience, I'm born of God, the life of God is inside of me, I leave Zoe, was something that, you know, that those yeah. of excitement, you're praying mm -hmm. and you're <laughs> I'm born of God. So yeah, and the first John 4, for greater I see that is him, that is in the world, so all of that, so. You can go on and on and yes, on. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, if you're giving an opportunity, just one, mm -hmm. opportunity to change something in the movie industry, what would it be? It would be to let to change the mindset of people in the industry. You don't get, you don't act, or you don't get to be an actor to be famous. It just so happens that fame comes along with the job. You don't act, so people write me and say, I want to be a star, I want to, that's not the purpose of acting. From the onset, if you have that mindset, it's going to go wrong, you become desperate, you will compromise, you lie your standards, lose your self dignity, because you want fame. That's why there are many people who are on Instagram, just being famous, who have no talent. You don't act to be famous. It just so happens. It's when you be a pilot, happens that you fly planes when you are a pilot. It just so happens. Okay. So people come in and just want to be famous. That's why we have half-baked actors, you know, sisters who are desperate, who yeah. will do anything for the fame and the fortune, because just want to be famous. People get on set and don't, can't, can't use tenses right, can't speak English right, don't know what the act job is about but drive a nice car and wear a tank top and have a body with hair and nails that are acrylic nails and they are stars. I don't understand that. I put 10 years if I got a major break. I don't know any other school besides the school of hard work. I know process, I know hard work. I do not know how you can twerk these days and have two million views and be a star the next week. I don't know how this new world. So if I have anything to so change the mindset that you are here as a vocation to express your God-given talent. If fame comes along the line, hurry, if it doesn't come, act Every set you go, I know you've done your best and you've done your job. Okay. Pascal, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for Before we end the show, what will be your last words on the show? For every young person, because I believe I'm sending young people, please find purpose. Your life only has true meaning with purpose, and your purpose can only be found in God. He has the manual for your creation. He says, before you were formed in the belly, I knew you and ordained you. Find your purpose and find God. Without God, trust me, your life has no real meaning. God bless you. Thank you so much, darling. Thank you. we we'll talk again. All right. If you don't doubt me. <laughs> it's been an amazing time here today with Pascal Lamanfo on the Noble Show. I want to thank Lizzie Beauty Center for my hair. Uh, you can locate her at Mata Heko, opposite one plus one. And uh, you can call her 0241 Zero two four one five two six nine nine eight. I want to thank La uh, Lanel Honey for sponsoring the show. NC Ryan Travels, NC Ryan Car Rentals, ABS Couture for my beautiful outfit. Thank you so much for sticking and staying with us today on the Noble Show. See you soon, time next week. My name is Dr. Gabriel.